this morning I uh, want us to continue praying for the leaders of our fellowship, Pastor Weber Mitchell, Pastor Greg Mitchell, and uh, we also pray for this nation, the leaders of this nation, uh, President uh, Edgar Rungu and uh, his cabinet. We also remember to pray uh, for your personal prayer requests, and also we pray for Brother Kelvin Kalela, those the sisters, so just uh, pray for God's comfort upon the uh, the family. Then uh, when we are done, uh, Brother Theogratius is going to come and uh, cross for us. Let us uh, pray. Father God, we give you praise and honor. We are grateful, my God. We are grateful, my God. Thank you to all of God for our We commit to this your God, Mr. Ray, we take you to the hospital. We ask you, my God, for your grace of God to continue to move in the God on the other side. As he preaches this morning, that Lord, you may open our hearts, Lord, that indeed we may receive that which you have for us this morning. Father, we pray for the brother who has lost his sister. We pray for comfort for the family. We lift up, oh Lord, the, uh, the, the laborers in the harvest field. We pray for uh, Pastor Rogers in Chingola. We pray for Pastor Roy in Kafue, Lord, that your hand be upon their ministries, Lord. You may strengthen them and have, uh, give them dominion in the areas where they labor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As we take our seats uh, this morning, I want to just welcome my uh, first time visitors. If this is your first time coming to this stage, just where you are seated, lift up your hands so that we you know where you are. Amen. Uh, thank God. Um, our little announcements. Uh, every morning, uh, from Monday to uh, Friday, uh, the doors of this church are open from zero six hours to eight hours uh, for um, morning prayers, and also uh, on Sunday we begin uh, Bible studies at zero nine hours. Uh, the morning service begins at 10 hours, which is uh, this very service that we are in right now. And also we meet uh, an hour uh, before every evening service for prayer in the powerhouse. This evening we'll continue with uh, another service at 17 hours. So I encourage you to be there. Uh, Wednesdays we meet for the midweek service at 18.30 hours. And uh, on the 29th of this month, we are going to have a concert. Uh, the titles are unveiled, so we have flyers on the notice boards. Both notice, notice boards. Uh, so please uh, pick a flyer and invite someone on the 29th of uh, August, 18.30 hours, right uh, outside uh, in our car park. That's what we have in our concert. Then uh, water baptism on uh, the 30th of this month. So if you have not yet registered uh, for water baptism, you can register with us there in the sound booth. And uh, also uh, Saturdays we go for outreach. Every Saturday we go for outreach at 14.45. We meet uh, in the uh, powerhouse. We pray 15 hours. We go in our neighborhood. So I want to ask uh, Brother Rogers to just give a report on uh, how it went yesterday. Yesterday, at 15, we went out, and so what we did yesterday is we split into two teams. One team went to Mokolojo, and the other one remained uh, just in the immediate area of Valley State Street, so we could uh, cover a wider area. So we ministered, invited people for uh, the concert that we're having next Saturday, 
And at the end of that, we had 13 people give their lives to Jesus. And uh, um, for Louis Nyokera, I want to thank the church for the support rendered uh, during the sickness of his uh, brother and uh, the funeral. So uh, he's uh, saying thank you for your support. And uh, also uh, uh, the Kakomas and the Kantinis, uh, they want to thank the church for the support rendered during uh, their wedding uh, last week. So the saying, God uh, richly bless you for support. This uh, morning, before we uh, take our offering of the court which I want to uh, lead to uh, this morning, it says uh, a vision that is not worthy of a sacrifice is not a class-like uh, vision. Uh, a class-like vision, we see it in Matthew chapter 28, this is uh, 19 and uh, 20. When, uh, at, when Jesus reached uh, the end of his ministry here on earth, he told his uh, disciples to say that, uh, go in all the world, continue doing what I've been doing, reaching out to, uh, to souls, make disciples, teach them to observe everything which I have commanded you. And we saw these disciples doing uh, what Jesus Christ uh, had put upon their hearts, the vision that Jesus Christ had put upon their hearts. And uh, as uh, far as I'm concerned, it's not everybody who went out uh, to preach the gospel. Among us, uh, the, the, that group which was, which was following Christ, there were some people who didn't know, that have not heard of, or maybe writing any book in the Bible that they, they preached, but these people participated by giving the ministry so that Paul, Peter can go to Rome and go to different parts of Israel and uh, to the Gentiles to preach the gospel. And uh, we have seen the thankfulness of these uh, people that even today the gospel has reached even to this generation. Porter's house started in the uh, uh, USA and because of the faith to give us today we are here seated. People gave and they sent a missionary to give. And they sent a missionary to make disciples. And here we are this morning. And uh, like you have heard uh, from uh, the uh, report, yesterday we loaded up the bus with fuel and people, we went to Chilenge preaching the gospel and 13 people got saved. All this was made possible because of faith to give us. Amen. So this morning, I want to encourage you, let's continue pushing this uh, vision that Christ has put upon our hearts even to the next generation by continuing being faithful. Yesterday, it's not everybody who came for outreach, but I believe some people here, they participated in that outreach because they've been faithful for giving. Amen. So uh, this morning, I want you to continue partnering with us by giving to the extension of the kingdom of God as the ashes are coming forward. And who uh, praise the who praise the, the gift and the giver this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful this morning for your grace. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings in our lives. This morning, even as we bring the tithes and offering, I pray that you bless every faith. We have blessed the gift also in Jesus' name. Amen. We praise the Spirit this morning.
place in the house of Yah. And Asen is doing much better, but much better is not good enough. So uh, hopefully next week he can uh, come back and he's been sick. If you do have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 13, verse 31. Numbers 13, 31 to 33, and then chapter 14, 1 and 2, Numbers. Hillary Clinton was the 2016 Democratic candidate for the U.S. presidential election, which she obviously lost to Mr. Donald Trump. But in her latest book entitled, What Happened? In this book, she explains as to what could have led to her loss. Obviously, she took responsibility. She says, it is all on me, but part of the blame, she blames the then FBI director, Mr. James Comey, for her loss. In the book, she says, Mr. Comey released a statement the night before the election. The statement was that he would revisit the case of Mrs. Hillary Clinton, which she was previously cleared, with the possibility of arresting her and eventually sending her to jail. She goes further, she says she believed that that statement influenced people to lose confidence in her and eventually decided to vote against her. In our text this morning, again, I'll be foolish to bring politics in this. In our text this morning, we have a congregation of people who were impacted for eternity by the words of their leaders, so to speak. What a preacher sermon I've entitled, The Impact of Our Words. The Impact of Our Words. In Numbers chapter 13, verses 31. The Bible reads as follows. But the man who had grown up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anna came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Verse 1 of chapter 14, it says, So all the congregation lifted up their voices, wept, uh, uh, lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had but died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. The impact of our words this morning. May God bless the reading of his word. Let me consider number one, the limitations of our words. The limitations of of our words and under that we look at a personal dimension or on a personal level. Words this morning, they bring forth the issues of our lives, the Bible declares. By words that are spoken, the contents of a man or a woman's heart are revealed. By words, the Bible says the future is revealed. By words, the spirituality of an individual is revealed. By words, the dominion, which is the right to rule, is revealed of an individual. Numbers chapter 14, verse 28, say these words. Say to them, 
as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. And so here God says, I take note of the words that you speak. You may not address them to me in prayer. You may not just speak them to me as God. But the mere fact that you have spoken those words, the Bible says, he takes notice to what we speak. And consequently, he says, I will do to you according to the words you have spoken. The words we speak this morning have the power to limit us. How far you go in life, in your walk with God, they have the ability to restrict how much you are able to do in the kingdom of God. Proverbs 18, 29, 21. Life and death are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. The message translation puts it this way. Words kill. Words give life. They are either poison or fruit. You choose. Words, they kill. Words, they give life. And the writer says they are either a poison or they are a fruit. And the Bible leaves it open to you and I to say you choose what you are, what you are going to, uh, uh, to, 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 to allow it to do. The words we speak are powerful this morning. They can have a positive or a negative impact on the people and also on the community this morning. And so, but we need to note that these words need not to be audible, so to speak. It is the words we speak in our hearts, the words we speak in our minds. We may not voice them, but these are what consume us this morning. And, and the Bible says God takes notice of even the unspoken words this morning. They need not to be audible. We speak them in our hearts, in our minds, to ourselves. Usually this plays out when we're going through a hard time, when things are not going as planned. And it is in those moments that, that we begin to speak words that are undesirable to ourselves. The Bible this morning shows us a, a number of people who spoke words to themselves. Either they restricted God or they restricted the hand of God upon their life. I'm reminded, 1 Samuel 27 verses 1, the Bible speaks of David at a crucial time in his life. But the Bible speaks these words and David said in his heart, not audibly, he wasn't heard by those that were near him. This was a conversation he had between himself and his heart, the Bible says, he said these words in his heart, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me anymore in any part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. And so here is David. He has been anointed as king uh, uh, over Israel, but uh, Saul was still on the throne. Saul is still the commander of the armies of Israel. In addition to that, Saul hates David and he has determined to kill David because he has known that David has been chosen over by God to take over the kingdom of Israel. But the Bible says, here is so he purposes in his heart to pursue David and to kill David and to get rid of David because he knew that he was the one standing in the place of him continuing as king and further on the throne being passed on to his children. But, but, but here we find that Saul has aimed the whole artillery of Israel against David and is hunting him. And in the midst of all this, David is weary, David is discouraged, David is frustrated. Things are not working out. Yes, I'm anointed, but I'm not yet enthroned. And here is David. Time has passed and now he's processing these things in his heart. But like the Bible says, he's processing them in his heart and he comes to a conclusion and he, that conclusion directs his actions. He says, I must die by this soul. And so because of that, I will run to the Philistines. I will run and hide there. Perhaps Saul will refrain his hand 
from pursuing me. Now you must know this morning that the Philistines were enemies of God. They were enemies of the children of God. And this is David. He's brought up in the nation of Israel. He knows who the enemies of God are. He actually killed Goliath, the Philistine. And yet in a time of crisis, in a time of difficulty, the Bible says as he was pondering this, he comes to a conclusion within himself. He speaks these words. He says, I will go to the Philistine and align myself with them. The half soul will stop pursuing me. All that was triggered by the conversation he had within himself. Came to a conclusion and it played out in his actions. Listen to me this morning, our words to ourselves, yes. But also our words to others, they have an impact upon them. And so here is David. He leads 600 men and their families into an, an illegal alliance with the enemies of God. He goes, uh, and the Bible says he's given land. He begins to stay there. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's away from the will of God, so to speak, all because uh, of uh, what he began to speak to himself. What words are you speaking to yourself, Israel? You of yourself to others. What words are you speaking? Of yourself to God, what words are you speaking? The challenge with words this morning is that once they are spoken, everything within us must back what has been spoken. That's the challenge with words. Once they are conceived within you, everything within you must align to what you are saying within yourself. That's the challenge with words. You cannot speak one thing and do the other. Not only do they have impact on ourselves, but words have impact on others. In our text, we see the whole congregation of the children of Israel angry, frustrated, demoralized, weeping simply because of the words spoken by ten men who were entrusted to go and spy out the land. These were leaders, like I've mentioned, of the tribes of Israel, men with credibility, men with influence, men who were appointed by Moses to, to carry out this task. Verse, verse, verse uh, 33, the Bible says, but the men who had gone up with him are saying, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. I asked the question this morning to these, uh, thus far, has it been done only by your strength? Has it been in your power that you have reached where you are? Because they are saying, we cannot, we are not able to overcome the enemies of God. Little did they know these people that, that it was God at work in their lives. It was God at work for them. And here they are, they are beginning to take matters into their own hands. They are saying, we cannot, we are not able, as if God has forsaken them, as if God has left them. Numbers chapter 14 verse 1, he says, so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. You can imagine this morning what is going on in the minds of these people. They are the brink of their inheritance. They are the brink of their promise. And yet they hear the report of these trusted men that they have put their future in, aspire the land for us, and come and give us a report. And when these men came, the Bible says their words discouraged their whole congregation. We cannot do it. All their lives, they have lived with this hope of entering the promised land for the past 40 years in the wilderness. They look forward to this and yet they come at the brink of entering the promised land. And the Bible says they are left frustrated and discouraged because of the words of the ten spies that went. Again, uh, the consequence uh, that uh, this was a fatal decision. God heard what they said. Numbers 14, verse 3 and 4 says, Why has the Lord brought us to this land? To fall by this word that our wives and our children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they say to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. And so we see here the effect of the words of these ten spies had an 
an impact on these people. A rebellion was stirred in the congregation because of the words that they spoke. They thought of returning to Egypt, which is a representation of the former life. How many times do men and women this morning think of returning to their former life the moment they hit a rock bottom, the moment they hit a brick wall? All of a sudden, they default to their old nature and want to go back to their former life. And here we see that all this was triggered by the words of the ten spies. Numbers 14, 29 to 30 says, The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who are numbered according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. And so here is God. He intervenes. He says, I'm bringing a judgment. None of you shall enter except for Joshua and Caleb. And so they were forbidden from entering. Let's look secondly this morning at the positive impact of our words. The positive impact of our words. Stories told of Michael Jordan when he was 15 years old. His coach denied him inclusion in the school basketball team. And the reason he gave was, you are too skinny, Jordan. And the story goes that he went home and he did like any other bound up teenager would do, locked himself in his room and cried. But unlike most teenagers, the demotion or the rejection that Jordan faced by or rather from his coach motivated him to hone his skills. He told ESPN, he says, whenever I was working out and got tired and figured I ought to stop, I would close my eyes and see that beast in the locker room without my name on it. And so he says, visualizing that roster or that rota did the trick for me. And so he went ahead and, and worked himself up. And the story goes that in that very season, this guy did the great things. Now, for everyone that overcomes the negative words spoken about them or about their lives, there are many that have been buried by the words spoken by someone that is influential in their life. This can be a parent, this can be a teacher at school, this can be a coach, this can be a boss at work, this can even be a pastor this morning. For many, there are many rather that have been buried. They have buried their dreams because a word was spoken on their life. Now, there's need for us to have a paradigm shift, so to speak, in relation to the words we speak of ourselves and of others. Many here this morning, we think that words are inconsequential. I beg to differ with you this morning because words are the currency of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God functions on words this morning. It matters what we say, whether to ourselves or to others. The Bible again is filled with instances where men and women changed uh, the course of their life simply because they determined to speak better of themselves and that those words encouraged these men and women to do something great by the words they spoke. They managed to open, to have access into the possibilities of God. Story of a woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says for a period of 12 years, she spent all she had on medical bills and yet to no avail. She spent all her livelihood and found no remedy. And so we, we, we see her this morning. She's frustrated, yes. She's discouraged, yes. She's beaten down by the devil, yes. And yet she understood that life and death lay in the power of that. The words she was speaking were crucial to whether or not she would find a remedy to her situation. In Mark chapter 5, verse 27 to 29 to 28, the Bible says, When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, listen to this, she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. She didn't say this to her neighbor. She didn't say this to, to her mother. The Bible says that she is trafficking Jesus is thrown by many. And then she says this within herself. She says, If only I can 
touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made well. She said to herself, she could be healed. She didn't speak and believe to herself. She said, I shall be made well. Many don't say those words to themselves. They say things like, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't believe. For me, maybe, maybe you, maybe you, Pastor, but me, ah, uh, uh, time in Asira. And, and they, they, they say negative about themselves. But this woman, the Bible says, if regardless of our condition, she purpose within herself. If only I can touch the hem of his garment, my story will change. What are you speaking this morning? Because words are the currency of the kingdom of God. What are you speaking this morning? Has the enemy managed to convince you that there is no hope to the point that that has become your confession? Or are you going to speak the possibilities of God? The prodigal son told the story that he demanded a portion from his father of his inheritance. Again, this was, this was against the order of life. Before the father's death, went away to a far place. And there the Bible says he wasted his resources, doing what he always wanted to do. But the turning point came when all his money finished and he couldn't afford to sin any, anymore. How I many of sin is expensive this morning? Finally, the Bible says he had to ponder the consequences and he said to himself. There was no crowd there to pop him up. There was no, there was, oh, give me a high five. You believe it? I believe it. Ah, God. No, no, there was nothing of that nature. The Bible says he said to himself, Luke 15, verse 17 and 18. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to eat and to spare? And here I am perishing with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. My point this morning is, in plain language, this boy determined the truth of his condition and a course of action to take. It took place in his mind. It led him to a great reconciliation and a great future, which he already had. But he had to come to a point where he began to speak to himself about the way things were. What are you saying this morning? What's your confession? What words are you speaking about your finances, about your marriage, your ministry even, your work in the kingdom of God? What are you saying about those things this morning? He was far, yes, but he started on a journey back home. It was a lonely journey, yes, but he was on his way home. Broke and beaten down by sin, yes, but he was on his way home. It all started with the words he said to himself. In our text, we have two men that stood up to defend the position of God by the words they spoke. Numbers 13, verse 13. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and say, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Numbers 14, 6 to 9. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephthah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are bread, uh, they are our bread, their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And so here we see, uh, seemingly outnumbered by those that brought a negative report, and yet the Bible is coming on two, uh, two out of, out of twelve. It's not, it's not really a a good number. You'd love to side with the ten. But here is uh, uh, Caleb and Joshua. The Bible says they refused to remain quiet. Even when the odds were against them, they refused uh, to remain silent. Disappointed, yes. Angry, yes. Crying and rebellious. The people, yes. Complaining. 
complaining to Moses, wanting to stone him. Yes, but these two men, the Bible says, they chose to rise in the midst of the confusion. Fight the people and say, listen, we are not here all by ourselves. There is a God delivered us from Egypt, managed to lead us through, yes, difficult times, but in the wilderness we saw him, and if he will have mercy and be with us, we are more, we are well able to overcome. We can do this. In the midst of defeat, I don't know, it's easy to stand up for truth when everybody around you is standing for truth. It's easy to defend the truth when everybody's defending truth. It's a different story, however, when the majority is defending an error, and here you are, you have to defend the truth. I mean, human nature, we want to be accepted. We want to be loved. We want to go with the, with the, that's human nature. But here we see that these men defied the odds. The Bible says, two out of twelve, they stood up and says, no, we know what they're saying is wrong, but this is what we saw. This is what we believe. We serve a God of possibilities. We are able. And so here they are. They wanted to defend the truth of God. What word are you speaking this way? About your nation? What words are you speaking? Let me close. By looking at healing our words. Healing our words. In 2011, I, my wife and I, we took over the church in Matera. First part of 2011. And was excited. But, again, the only church I knew was Levi. So my reference, my bearings, where live I? So here we are in Matero. Four weeks down the line, I, 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 mean, I, mean, I mean, the waters were happening. I came back running to my pastor. Because everything I know how a church should function is not what I saw there. And I fear for my spiritual life, the culture was, was, was off the green. I mean, the board, the notice board said afternoon service 16 hours, midweek service 18 hours, but there was no midweek service. The board said outreach 10 hours, there was no outreach. The board said morning prayer 6 to 8, there was no morning prayer. And so in that environment, that couch I stepped in, it was stifling me, it was killing me. I came to my pastor and said, Pastor, this, this, things are not as I envisioned. I was genuinely scared for my spirituality. I thought I would be drowned, I would be converted <laughs> to that culture. In that, I think, two hour discussion in his office, Pastor Day looked at me and said, You are different, Simon. You are different. Don't be scared. That's why you are there. Those words rejuvenated me, those words added months to my, to my life, those words brought freshness, those words brought a recalibration to my, to, my, to, to, to my vision, those words cleared the smoke that was clouding my mind, those words paved the way for me, I said, if my pastor believes in me, I mean, I can take the one for Jesus. I went from, I came out of that office, coming out, I think I was floating. I wasn't walking on ground, but I was floating. Revived, rejuvenated, why? Because of the words of belief, the words of hope, the words of encouragement, my pastor then gave me. We need healing for our words this way. We need healing for our words. Much of the battles we fight, is over the control of our words. In James, he tells us, he says, he who controls his tongue is a perfect man. And so the battle many times is won when we demonstrate control over the words we speak, number one, to ourselves, but also to others that are hearing us this morning. Men and women that are in the sphere of our influence, children that you are raising, the words you speak to them, 
may matter this morning. This plays out in our relationships, in the home, between husband and wife, to our children, our co-workers, our brothers and sisters in the church. The words we speak, they have, they matter this morning. They are able to channel somebody into a particular direction. I've made a conscious decision never to say certain words to my wife. Never. No matter how hard the things may get, never to say certain words in my marriage about my marriage. Never. There are some people that threaten their wives. How? What? What? And then they say,
that new heart, that clean heart, we have a responsibility to begin to fill it up with the new things, new way of doing business. That is where you and I have to cooperate with the work of salvation. That is where you and I have to cooperate with God because we have a responsibility this morning and a duty to fill the new heart with things, with new ways, new ways of talking, new ways of doing things. We look at the word of God. We have an inclination to what God says and we do that. We are building our hearts. We are feeding our hearts. We are feeding our new man, our new woman this morning. And as we do that, in the crisis of life, in the, in the, in the, in the times of hardships, then we will draw from the contents of the heart, which has been renewed, which has been replenished, which has been worked on. And when we draw from there, it will be words of healing that will be able to speak. Why? Because the transformation has taken place. Alas, to a heart which is unrepentant, because then in the crucial times of your life, you will draw from the experiences of your life. God is never your ally in times of trouble. You can never call upon him in times of trouble to help you. You can never, he can never make a peace with you. Why? Because it's not your ally. The regeneration has not taken place. The salvation has not taken place. But, but, but listen to me this morning. When our hearts are clean and our hearts are new, when God has done the work within us, then we can call out for to God for help. Why? Because we're in union with him. We have a relationship with God. It can only happen when you and I bow our knees to God. That will be able to speak words of encouragement. That will be able to speak words of peace. That will be able to speak words of God's possibilities in our text. The Bible says, Joshua and Caleb, they stood up. Not from without. These were men, the Bible actually knows that a different spirit was upon them. These were men with a different spirit from the other ten. And they stood up. They saw God in everything. They said, listen, our God is able. He has helped us this far. Our God is able, and if He determines uh, that we should, we should be able to overtake these people, they are like bread to us. Uh, we can crush them, uh, and He speaks possibilities. Why? Because they had a relationship with God. This morning, when I was speaking, not when things are all rosy, but when time, when life puts you between a rock and a hard place, what are you confessing? Because it matters the words we speak this morning. We hear this bow and let the eyes go in respect to God and the person that is sitting next to you. I appreciate you. I thank God for you this morning. You are here, you are not saved, you are not right with God. I want to give you an opportunity to have your heart renewed this morning, to have your heart reconnected with your Maker. God wants to restore you. God wants to give you a clean heart. That begins by you bowing your knee at the foot of the cross this morning. That's you, you're not saved, you're not born again. You don't have your sins forgiven. You're not right with God. I want to give you an opportunity this morning. Would you lift up your hand and pray with me? Anybody here this morning, you're not saved, you're not born again. You're not right with God. Think about this morning and saying, Pastor, I need Jesus. I need to start all over again. That's you. Maybe you used to be a Christian, but you're backslidden. No longer that relationship is no longer there. That's you this morning. Lift up your hand and you begin a prayer at this altar this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I want to pray with our friends following us online. You're not right, you're not saved, but you want to be saved this morning. Would you repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, this morning I come to you as a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Give me a clean heart, a new heart in Jesus' name. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. You rose again, and now you are alive. Help me to live my life for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Appreciate it.
thank God. But I want to change the order of the service this morning. Speaking to Christians here, talking on a number of things. We need to be careful the words we speak. Why? Because words are the currency of the kingdom of God. Words have an impact on ourselves. Words have an impact on the people that hear us, especially people that you have influenced over this morning. You're a parent. What words are you speaking to your children about their father, about their mother? What words are you speaking to them? To God, what words are you speaking? This morning I want to challenge you to come to the place here, to the altar, lay down and just begin to ask God to help you this morning. These altars are open. Let's come and find a place to pray as we stand and sing a song this morning. Hallelujah. These altars are open. Let's come and find a place to pray. God, bring a healing to the words we speak this morning. Hallelujah.
Kaibula, would you close for us in the prayer this morning? Please can continue praying for as long as they want.